Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and we've got a number of things going on right now around the world. Al Jazeera reporting here just a little short while ago there that uh, Russia has launched new strikes inside of Ukraine. Want to go to that story there. Then we're going to be going to Gaza, Israel, uh, the Christian uh, genocide that has happened around the globe. Tucker Carlson. Uh, co covered that just recently. But we are first continuing to, to search uh, through the Al rubble Jazeera. for victims. Russia has intensified its attacks in eastern Ukraine in recent weeks. Charles Stratford reports from the site of the attack. Ukrainian emergency services are telling us that what you can see behind me is the destruction left by a so called glide bomb. This is this new repurposed Soviet built weaponry that certainly the Ukrainians are saying they're seeing the Russians use a lot more in this area. The big fear here now is the so-called double tap. The Russians increasingly dropping ordnance like this on a given area, waiting around an hour or so, waiting for the emergency services that are busy trying to, we believe, get more bodies from under the rubble, wait until they arrive and then hitting them again. We understand that at least two people were killed in this attack, and as I say, there is a search ongoing for more bodies under the rubble. Three shops are on fire. Behind the shop, the house is on fire. My wife Olga, her friend and her 14-year-old child died there. But we don't know, maybe someone else is still under the rubble. Suddenly, the police tell us there's a Russian drone above. We have to get in the bomb shelter. Inside, a mother grieves her dead daughter on the floor. A third person killed in the attack. We're around 10 kilometers from the Russian border. The authorities here tell us that this village itself has come under attack at least 10 times in the last seven days. And it's an indication. You know, what's interesting is to see Al Jazeera actually go more on the west side there. Uh, that generally does not happen, but, uh, but it is of interest uh, to say the least there. I uh, also want to take you to uh, Iran. There is uh, breaking news uh, on two different issues there. Iran closes airspace over the Tehran, citing military maneuvers. <clears throat> Iran's Minister of Defense orders sus uh, suspension of flights as of midnight tonight. This comes after reports that Iran and its proxies are preparing to carry out an imminent strikes in Israel. Of course, there has been other news that has come out that's saying that Iran is testing long-range missiles. So we really don't know what the case may be. Uh, but then also we got this report, too, that Israel uh, reports are coming out of Azerbaijan suggests that when, uh, when and if Iran actually strikes Israel, Israel respond, respond from the territory of Azerbaijan to hit Tehran uh, first there. <clears throat> so it really just comes down to Who's going to strike who, when, and where? And I do believe this is one of the reasons why the Israelis pulled out of uh, Gaza, not because of humanitarian needs uh, and not because they cared about the Palestinian people, but rather because they're getting ready for another front. And Israel cannot afford to have all of its tanks inside of Gaza when there is a front going on with Hezbollah, with Iran, etc., so interesting to, to say the least there. Scott Ritter brought out some very interesting points too on Israel, uh, saying Israel is losing the war and the IDF won't survive uh, according to uh, this, this counterattack. But uh, let's listen to what Scott Ritter had to say here on uh, Danny uh, Huffong's uh, program. What the hell Israel's doing here? How do you, as an American, how do you wrap your head around the, the absolute failure of your government to stand up for anything. I mean, my God, there's an attack at the Crocus City Hall terrorism. We're not talking about that anymore either. There's an attack in Moscow, and the United States comes out within minutes and says, we know who did it, ISIS. We know who didn't do it, Ukraine. Russia, there's no need for you to do this investigation. We know the answer. Um, and, but no. Israel doesn't attack this one vehicle, but they attack the initial vehicle. Second vehicle comes up, takes bodies out, takes survivors out, tries to drive away. Bam, Israel hits that too. The third vehicle comes up, takes the survivors, 
puts it in. Bam, Israel hits that too. Not one, but two, but three vehicles targeted by the Israelis after they declared the route they were going on. After they said these are the vehicles that were marked and were in the timetable, Israel took them out, assassinated them. In the United States, what's the response? We're waiting for the Israeli investigation to, uh, to make a final determination about what happened. And if whatever, we will respect whatever the Israelis uh, say happened. And, you know, it's war and war's hell and sometimes bad things happen. But we're going to wait for the Israeli investigation. So we're going to wait for the Israeli investigation when it's obvious what happened. But we're not going to support any Russian investigation because we, we throw out a cover story that falls apart immediately. The hypocrisy of America is, uh, is, is unreal. I, even today, when, when you're supposed to be saying uh, the hypocrisy of the U.S. government standing behind Israel, regardless of what goes on, that lets you know how much control Israel has over the political narrative in this nation. And uh, in reality, that's, that's what it comes down to. They have full control over the political narrative in uh, this nation here. Uh, anyway, Hamas says it doesn't have 40 living hostages required for a ceasefire deal. Let's listen into this, uh, this as well. Well, I guess we do not. I thought there was actually to this article was a video with this. Hamas says it doesn't have 40 living hostages required for the ceasefire deal. Israel agreed to the ceasefire deal with uh, that would see the release of 40 women, elderly and sick hostages. But Hamas reportedly told negotiators it is unable to identify 40 living captives in that category who were kidnapped from Israel more than six months ago. In exchange, Israel would have released hundreds of Palestinian prisoners of both uh, Israel and Gaza would have had six to eight weeks ceasefire. But Hamas told Egypt and Qatar uh, international mediators and nego negotiations that it does not have 40 hostages who would be in the category to release, according to the multiple reports. Uh, that <clears throat> is certainly not going to go over very well with the Israeli people. Uh, or even, for that matter, the Israeli government. But nonetheless, uh, you got to kind of wonder what has happened to them. Were they killed by Hamas? Were they killed from starvation? They, did, did they die from starvation? Or did they die in Israeli airstrikes that have been unrelenting all this time? Uh, you know, the, the Hannibal Doctrine would certainly allow for their deaths and uh, easily blame it on someone else. Not really sure the answer to that. Uh, as far as that goes there. We're going to go to Tucker here in just a moment there. Uh, but before I do, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll go to Tucker first. And then, ooh, no, let me let me, let me me take you to, uh, uh, before I do that, to Gideon Levy. Gideon Levy is an Israeli. He is a historian and uh, a very outspoken uh, I mean, he's about the crimes that are being done against the Palestinian people. Let's listen to what he had to say. Uh, about Israel's actions in Gaza just recently. Israeli, I was born in Israel. I even perceive myself as an Israeli patriot. I care about Israel, I belong to Israel, I'm attached to Israel. Don't speak about symmetria because there is no symmetria. I would even suggest that there is no conflict. Was there a French-Algerian conflict? There was a brutal French occupation in Algeria, which came to its end. And there is no Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There is a brutal Israeli occupation which must come to its end one way or the other. In our backyard, there is a regime which is today by far one of the most cruel, brutal tyrannies on earth. And I know what I say because I cover it for 40 years. And this regime cannot be defined but as an apartheid. Two peoples live on one piece of land. One people has all the rights in the world, and I'm talking now only about the occupied territories. One people has all the rights in the world. The other people has no rights whatsoever. It looks like apartheid. It talks like apartheid. It is apartheid. And nobody can contradict it. Go to the Jordan Valley. See the prosperity in the settlements, and then go and see the Palestinians who live there without electricity, without water, without any rights. And then tell me if it's apartheid, or you might invent it another title. I'm in Israel. That's exactly right. <clears throat> it is apartheid. And uh, Gideon Levy, uh, an Israeli-born Jewish man, standing up for Palestinians. Like I said, it's very rare that anyone will stand for the Palestinian people. But in his case, 
He actually does. I want to play Tucker Carlson for you as well. He is taking a beautiful stand for Christians. Listen into this here. Completely devastated. Nine out of 10 of them are no longer there. They're gone. Um, that was an effect of our foreign policy, but it was almost never noted in the United States and almost never, ever even mentioned by Christian clergy in this country, many of whom supported that war and that occupation. Why is that? Maybe because it wasn't, virtually no one in any American church said anything when Christians were killed in Syria, very often by Islamic extremists paid for by the United States. But nobody said anything, and anyone who did was denounced as a kook or a bigot somehow. Standing up for Christians was not allowed in the U.S. media. We saw that firsthand. And so, once again, it continued. In Ukraine, where the U.S. government has sent far more than $100 billion to the Ukrainian government, and what happened? What did that government do? Well, it banned an entire Christian denomination. The Zelensky government is busy throwing Orthodox priests and nuns in jail and having the army raid churches. But again, not a word. But what about Gaza? What about the entire region in the Middle East, where, of course, there's very intense fighting going on? Many Christian churches in the United States, particularly evangelical churches, support that. But there is virtually never a word about the Christians who live there, the ancient Christian community in Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel proper. So... Because no one has said a word, there has been great suffering among the Christian population uh, in that region. In October, a Greek Orthodox church in the Gaza Strip was hit by an airstrike. We're showing the video now. The church is in ruins. At least 17 people were killed that day. And again, that was hardly the first time that fighting in that region killed Christians. You'll remember the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem almost 20 years ago, where a, a clergyman was killed in the church with American weapons and... Christian clergy in our country said nothing. And you may be asking yourself, well, wait a second, if Christian leaders won't stand up for the lives of Christians, why have them in the first place? And that's probably a good question. So you would think that in Congress, there, where there are many self-professed Christians, somebody might be piping up on behalf of uh, their brethren in the Holy Land, but no, just the opposite, in fact. For example, at a town hall event last month, Michigan Congressman Tim Wahlberg, a former evangelical pastor, said he would like to see the region treated like Hiroshima was treated. Watch this. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. I agree. It should be like Nakasagi and Hiroshima. Get over quick. The same, the same should be in Ukraine. Defeat Putin quick. Instead of 80% of our funding for Ukraine being used for humanitarian purposes, it should be 80%, 100% to wipe out Russian forces. If that's what we want to do. So to be clear, as a theological matter, Christianity is not the religion of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's the religion among all world religions that uniquely abhors mass killing. In fact, it it is the religion that abhors mass killing. There's no excuse for that from a Christian perspective. And here we have a former pastor calling for it. But again, how are the Christians doing in that region, in Gaza, the West Bank, and in Israel proper? We almost never hear from them, and so we thought it would be interesting and maybe edifying to hear from one right now. The Reverend Munther Ishak is the pastor at the Evangelical Lutheran Christian Church in Bethlehem, and we're honored to have him join us. Uh, Father Ishak, thank you very much for coming on. Um, so let me just ask you a broad question to start. How are Christians in the Holy Land in the three places I mentioned, West Bank, Israel proper, and Gaza, how are they doing right now? Yeah, first, thank you for having me. Uh, these are very, very difficult times, uh, and it's been difficult for quite some time now. We'll pause it there. I'll put a link to this in the description for you so you can see Tucker's entire interview uh, on here about the Christian church and what is going on inside uh, of Israel against Christians as well as in Ukraine and other parts of the world. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Thank you for your support of this broadcast. You can see our website at the top of the screen there, IsraeliNewsLive.org, as well as our mailing address. Uh, if God lays upon your heart to want to help support the work we do, please do. You can visit us uh, or you can by mail at Stephen Benoon, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Thank you and God bless you.